Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Robert Olin Butler to discuss his new novel, Late City, published by our friends at Atlantic Monthly Press. Robert Olin Butler is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of 18 previous novels, including Hell, A Small Hotel, and Perfume River. He is also the author of six short story collections and a book on the creative process, From Where You Dream. He has twice won a National Magazine Award in Fiction and received the 2013 F. Scott Fitzgerald Award for its outstanding achievement in American literature. He teaches creative writing at Florida State University. To moderate this afternoon's conversation, we're joined by Chauncey Mabe. For more than 20 years, Chauncey worked as book review editor at the Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale. And boy, do we remember those wonderful times. Um, today, he lives in Miami, where he operates as a freelance writer, specializing in the arts, especially books, or anything else that catches his eye. He has followed Robert Olin Butler's literary output with pleasure since 1994, when the two met at Miami Book Fair's event for Bob's amusing and accomplished short story collection, Tabloid Dreams. Throughout this afternoon's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen and you can order your copy of Late City from Books and Books Below. We truly appreciate every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest to the virtual stage. Here we go. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Welcome. Hey, hey, Bob. Good to see you. Hey, Chauncey. Great to see you, my friend. One of the reasons that I followed uh, Bob's career so closely is that while he is, with all his awards, obviously an important writer of the last 40 years, um, I have found that while his literary ambitions and his literary um, quality is always very high, he's also always enjoyable. It's always fun to read one of his books. And you know, there are many books that are well worth reading that are not that much fun. I don't know how Bob, Bob does it, but he manages to have both those things at the same time. Um, also, I'm very happy to, to notice that while in, in 2009, in the, in the satirical novel Hell, Bob created one of the most compelling uh, portraits of the devil, old Satan himself, um, that, that I've ever read. It was hilarious. It kind of prefigured Donald Trump because it was the same kind of person. And in the new book, Lake City, he uh, we have the character of God. And um, while this is not a, a satirical book, the, the picture of God is pretty enjoyable. And um, Lake City, I, I'm very, as an old newspaper man, very happy to see, very interested to see that um, Lake City is about a lifelong um, journalist in the 20th century. He's uh, 115 years old now, and he's on his deathbed in a nursing home. And uh, just as he thinks the curtains are gonna come down, he gets a visit from God. And God um, encourages him to tell his life story, which tells us, as we know, God likes a good story. You know, <laughs> you can see that in the Jewish tradition, Christian, God likes a good story. And, um, you know, it's kind of like he's gonna judge he's going to judge Sam on the basis of the story. I think he's also going to judge him on the basis of the quality of the story and how well he tells it. <laughs> um, and it may be that he just wants a good story that Sam's, Sam's fate is already chosen. Um, Sam grew up uh, the son of a banker who was a, a, a cruel and vicious man, a banker and um, a racist. And he went off to world war one where he was a, um, a sniper, an accomplished sniper, and had some harrowing experiences. And he came came back after World War I uh, to follow um, his dream of a newspaper career through the Roaring Twenties and the history that follows. And 
pretty much mostly up to World War II, although the story continues after that. Um, but, you know, as, as, um, as a newspaper man living through that time, he meets some really famous people like Huey Long um, and Al Capone. And this could have been like a, a Zelig kind of story um, or a Forrest Gump kind of story where he just bounces from one famous person to another. But in fact, Bob has brought his focus down. This, this book, whatever else it is, however else it's framed, is the story about a single family. Bob, his wife, and his son. And um, that's where Bob plants his flag, is in that family dynamic. And I think that um, you will all enjoy it as much as I have. And now I turn, turn this over to Bob. I think Bob is going to read something for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chauncey. Yes, I am. I'm going to read um, about 20 minutes to you folks, um, a section of, of, the, of the book, which will, uh, after Chauncey's wonderful introduction, will pretty much explain itself. So uh, here we go. Ryan now, my son, sitting beside me on an elevated train the Northwestern line, though I can't see him yet, not clearly. Instead, I feel the abrupt collision of Al Capone and my son, a realization that holds me back. The abruptness, I assume, a product of my dying brain. My son and I are sitting on a green plush transverse seat of the latest model of elevated rolling stock. I'm explaining the new train car to him. I know that much about this moment. Though on my deathbed, I can't yet hear my voice. My brain is lagging, perhaps from my news reporter's proclivity for chronology. But no, I realize it's a proclivity that might still be at work. The Capone massacre in the parking garage was on a Thursday. This is two days later, Saturday, and I have the day off. My own contribution to yesterday's front page was at the top of column one, but beneath the full page banner headline about the massacre, whose story dropped into column eight. Mine is Thompson declared unfit for office. Voters League calls for removal. Not totally unrelated to the banner headline as Mayor Big Bill Thompson back in office for a third term after a four year hiatus of diversified pocket lining on the Waterways Commission has long worked closely with Torio and Al and their boys. And abruptly, I am afraid. Recognizing how my thoughts have just wandered from my son to a long since meaningless news story I published nine decades ago, even to the detail of its very headline. I am afraid that this present haziness about the L train rushing northward and and my son sitting beside me that this very haziness suggests why chronology persists in my dying brain i neglected him and time has rolled on with no way to make it up i spent too much of his first years on earth apart from him in my work, in my preoccupations, in my focused attention, even as he passed from an infant floating in my hands to a smart, articulate, rapidly growing boy sitting beside me on a Saturday morning nearly six years later. I loved him all along through that whole passage. I truly did, and I know I told him so, overtly now and then at least, as I had never heard from my own father, nor felt. And I spent what time I could with my son. I sense all this from the cold and freshly besnowed Saturday morning that my memory has chosen for me, even if I'm presently prevented from remembering any specifics backward or forward from it. But I didn't do enough for my son. I realized that. Even on this elevated ride, I wasn't present enough with him. Surely that's what God wants me to understand. A testament to my neglect sits sideways in the aisle. 
propped vertically against me, my arm around it to keep it steady. Weeks ago, Ryan woke to Christmas morning into the object I am presently clutching upright, a flying arrow sled with a horizontal backless seat of hardwood slats, varnished red and blue, and its name writ large in the center and with runners made of tempered spring steel, fully controlled by a steering arm slat across the front. This swell sled has sat propped against the wall of Ryan's room for this past month and a half, during which Chicago has been filled every day with snow, and I've had several of those days off, and it did not previously occur to me to instigate this outing. The sled was given on Christmas morning with a promise that he and I would learn to use this wonderful thing together, seeing as his Louisiana dad never had one. And Ryan has been a good boy, a very good and courteously indulgent boy, not to push me about that promise. He waited for his dad to feel on his own that the time was right, though my son's courteous indulgence shames me now, which dispels the haze. And I turn my face to Ryan. He is watching the flash of second floor windows at the back of the brick three flats, our elevated track nearer a flat's window than its own front door. Most are curtained, some are not, and when a figure is visible, Ryan lurches ever so slightly toward it and flips his face ever so slightly to follow its passing. One window frames a boy pressed there watching the train, and Ryan sees him and starts to lift his hand, but the gesture it wishes to make is stymied by the quick vanishing of the boy. Ryan turns away. He realizes I'm watching, and he looks up at me. Were you going to wave at him? I asked. Yes. He was gone too fast, I say. No, Ryan says, I was gone too fast. I laugh. He's right, of course, my smart little man. I have never talked baby talk to him. Colleen has picked that up too. Tender talk, but not baby talk. I say, that happens sometimes with people. Ryan nods gravely, looks away outside. For a time, he seems to stop following the passing windows. What are you thinking, I ask. I'm glad we've got all day, Ryan says. Me too, I say. That boy doesn't care, he says. He just watches everybody rush by. He doesn't expect to make a friend. And Ryan rolls his shoulders a little, shrugs off this topic. I can't wait to get sledding, I say. He nods at this and looks away again. He squares around and presses close to the window to watch some more. I find myself briefly faintly surprised. In spite of seeing my little man in my little boy, I expected the prospect of sledding to make him bubble. I now will hear his invocation of the long day ahead as a subtle rebuke for the long delay. But I let it rest. He wants to watch the passing city, and I turn to the sled leaning against me. I never had one as a boy, snow being unknown in Lake Providence, Louisiana, but I've done my repertorial research on all of this. He and I will learn together. So we ride to the end of the Northwestern line, passing from Chicago through Evanston until our train finally descends from its elevation into the Linden Avenue terminal in Wilmette. I've learned of a place with good sledding in otherwise flat Chicago and its flat environs. Ryan and I walk north and then east and across Sheridan Road and into a woods where slopes lined in ash and maple run down toward the lake. There are other boys in sleds busy at their sport, but there are several slopes and I find one for us that's lightly populated. It's a gentler slope with a dog leg and with a leveled foot in plain sight, perfect for a couple of beginners. Ryan is quiet still, focused and studious, but perhaps darker than that, perhaps even fearful. I need to adjust my plan. 
I thought we'd go straight to belly flops. We'd laugh at our failures. He would bubble. This isn't happening. So we discussed the sled for a time. Its relevant parts, discuss and examine it closely. We prepare for this the way a smart and articulate five-year-old has decided things should go. And he participates fully in the discussion, though thoughtfully, observing how the runners have grooves like skates and admiring the arrow shot through the flying arrow name emblazoned on the center slat. How clever a design that is. I talk sliding strategies with him, discounting the belly flop with the sled held vertically before you and a running diving start. A more moderate approach would be perfectly fine with a few pushing steps while bent forward into a grasp of the sled on the ground and a belly first easing onto the seat. He nods an understanding of this. Then we have talked as much as we can talk. It's time to actually sled. But though he has participated in our discussion with the precocity I admire in him, in which I know he enjoys in himself, his somber mood persists, the little man mood. But I have expected my little boy to appear, bubbling at last about this adventure. And I suddenly worry about all of the time I've spent away from him. He's had a full-time mother, but far less of a father, less, no doubt, than most other boys, even those who have hardworking fathers. The jobs of those men can be easily left behind in the office or in the factory. My job is to observe life, everything about life that is striking or dangerous or influential, and to give it daily voice to 400,000 Chicagoans. I have trouble turning that off when I arrive in the life of my child. In my head, at least, there is no end to my work day. So now I see a problem in Ryan's life. I blame myself. I helped create it. A problem for being a five-year-old little man is that you can miss the risk-taking of childhood. You miss the chance to teach your body and mind to be brave, to fool itself forever into thinking there's no price to be paid in order to be fully a man. Are you all right, I ask him. Yes, he says, unquaveringly, but he says no more. I've never done this before either, I say. Because of Louisiana, yes. So this is a new thing. The world is full of new things. I hesitate, but I add gently, be brave now. You're a brave boy. I, I know who you are. He looks at me. He looks at the sled, which I have placed between us. He looks down the slope. Shall I go first, I say. Yes, he says. I'll test our plans. Be brave, he says. And he shoots me a sly smile. I am glad to see the soberness dispelled. I will, I say. You're a brave papa, he says. I am, I say. And he steps back. And I bend the sled from behind and grasp it and push it along into the slope in an awkward little crouching rush. And I flop forward onto the seat, my torso fitting okay with my legs bent straight up at the knee. And I'm gliding along head first, going faster than I'd expected and gaining speed. And I grasp the handles of the steering slat for stability, but it's too much of a temptation to try to feel I'm in control. And I try to steer, which of course I overdo badly and I veer and tilt, and now my man-size on this boy sled prevails, and I find myself on my side in the snow and then on my back. I jump up, forcing a laugh even as I'm rising to reassure Ryan. I realize I'm a little disappointed that I feel the need to do this. I look up the slope. I don't see him. I pick up the sled, climb the slope, not worried, but puzzled. And there he is, lying on his back, his arms and legs extended. I am oddly relieved. He's making fun of his old man. Good. That's a spirit he can grow up on. 
He's even moving his arms and legs in an arc in the snow as if I were thrashing after my fall. In slow motion yet, I laugh an unforced laugh, but I'm wrong. Now that I've seen his little parody, now that I've laughed in appreciation, he should be looking at me, sharing my pleasure at this joke, but he continues the slow thrash and ignores my presence. I do not know what to say to my son. I stand in silence. Then he stops his arms and legs. Now he looks at me. Papa, he says, wait and see. And with meticulous movement of legs and torso and placement of feet and hands, Ryan slowly rises and rotates to the side and lifts one leg and takes as long a stride as he can and then quickly another as if not to disturb something. Now he briskly comes to me and turns to stand at my side. He directs my attention to where he was lying. I see for the first time what is there. An imprinted outline in the snow. The imprint of his stocking capped head and the length of his body. But instead of extended arms, the image is of extended wings. Instead of legs, the image is what can only be described as a gown. All this I perceive, but I am struggling to put these elements together. It's an angel, Ryan says. And so it is. I wish to find words, instructive, instructive words somehow, corrective words. Failing those for the time being, perhaps even carefully circumscribed, approving words, fatherly loving words. But in spite of words being my profession, even my life now, I have none for my son at this moment. He's bubbling beside me. Isn't she beautiful? He says. I do put my hand gently on his shoulder, a gesture he might well take as approval. But I am unsettled, and Ryan rushes forward, lies down beside his angel in the snow, and he begins to make another. The particularity of the scene begins to fade now, but I am aware that I will go on to teach myself to sled on this day as Ryan creates a choir of angels in the snow out of what I consider pitying consideration for his papa's enthusiasms, Ryan joins me once to ride on my back after I've mastered the sledding. But in that single run down the slope, I sense his deep unease and I press him no further. He returns to the snow to play on his own terms, until we are on the elevated. Ryan presses against the window on the trip home. He has led us to sit on the left-hand side of the car, viewing the same three flats that he watched coming out. It occurs to me that he's looking to see if the boy at the window will be there. But as I sit beside him, I vanish from the train. I am in France. I am barely 17 years old. I am still a boy. And I am a killer. I see my weapon in my hands, my Pennsylvania Enfield, and I lean into a broken wall, chest high, and across a rubbled field before me is a road, and beyond is a tree line of oak and beech, the, the bois la prota, the priest's wood. The September offensive has not yet begun. I am forward on reconnaissance, but also to watch for a target of opportunity. A passing German staff car is the prize, or a German sniper coming forward to us. And he emerges from the trees. I put my eye to the scope and my forefinger to the trigger. I see him clearly. But what I fully see lags a fraction of a second behind what I see that only fits my expectation. At first, a German soldier, armed, alone, emerging cautiously from the trees. 
square before me. And as I see him through the veil of my expectations, professionally alert enough to spot my flimsy cover and to evade me or to crouch and use the skills he and I share to pose a threat. And thus he must be taken for a worthy and immediate target. I see his forehead clearly in my scope and my crosshairs are upon it. So the process begins. The tip of my forefinger lying soft upon the trigger, my knuckle aiming, my breath calmly suspended. But in the next fraction of a second, just before the squeeze, I see him fully. And I know he is not a fellow sniper. His rifle is slung on his shoulder. His emerging step is not cautious, but fearful. His assessing first look is unsystematic, inept, and his face is the face of a boy. Perhaps 17. Perhaps a prematurely thoughtful boy. Perhaps a boy who's had a neglectful father. A boy who is ill-prepared for what the world is. And all of this next fraction insight rushes into me, even as my forefinger, trained effectively for this world as it is, does its work, and the spot on the boy's forehead between his eyes explodes. I am beside my son and panting hard. I can hear myself clearly, my desperate labored breath. I look to Ryan, he is unmoved, watching the distant three flats rush past, his limbs comfortably weary from making angels in the snow. And I am afraid. I am in the dark again. Uh, I, I, I think you were a little moved there, Bob. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is the evidence that I think I've, I'm okay with what what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, yeah. That's, it's you know it 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 comes from that place in me, so it might as well. It, if it does not keep going back there, then I haven't done my job. Yes. Well, um, you have so much experience that's relevant to this book. Um, you served in, in Vietnam as an intelligence officer. Um, and I, I was so happy to see that you um, set this book in the professional world of newspapers. And um, I understand that you were a reporter yourself at one time. I was. And by the way, somebody did a count. There are there at least six novels that I've written that have newspaper guys <laughs> or gals in the middle? So I, I was. I, um, and that, it was an interesting thing. It was a back-to-back -back experience major experience in my life back to back with Vietnam. I came home from Vietnam. Um, I, I went to New York wanting to, being interested in writing books. I wanted to get into publishing maybe as, as a rent, rent paying job in the meantime. Went through the writer's market book looking for all the publishers applied to, to Random House and so forth. Got turned down every place except for little intern jobs which wouldn't have paid my, my stay. And then I found something called Fairchild Publications, which was a publisher of business newspapers. They had a dozen business newspapers, most famous for Women's Wear Daily. Mm -hmm. All dozen were hard-nosed, investigative, real newspapers, weekly hard-nosed newspapers. And for some reason, I talked myself into a job there. I actually talked myself into an edit. I was the editor of a, of a whole section of the paper called the Communications Section of electronic news, all the electronic equipment involved in communications. And so I spent about uh, five of my years at, four years maybe at at, 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 energy, at, at, um, at Fairchild as that, as the reporter and the editor of that section. And then I came to the attention of the president of the company. They were, it was the middle of the energy crisis. They started a new, a business newspaper focused for people who were involved in business in conserving, managing, and purchasing energy because of the energy crisis going on. 
Uh -huh. And so they hired me, gave me a desk and a blank check, and said, create newspaper. So I went out and interviewed hundreds of people in that business. And it was written for the users of energy. So I, I, I talked to, I, I deeply interviewed hundreds of people in businesses of all sorts, of large and small. And the thing about a great investigative reporter is that when you have a source before you, what you do, you're not just taking notes. You make you have yourself project into the consciousness and the mind of that of that of that source. And what I learned from that is what I practice in all of my writing, which is which is that I inhabit the narrative voices of my characters and of the narrators in my in my work. It is the inhabiting of the of, of the speaker of the work. That is, uh -huh. that is, that is the, the heart of my process. Well, um, putting, um, putting a journalist in the forefront of this, uh, of this novel and in um, daily newspaper journalism in its heyday, yeah. what did that do for you as a, as a novelist in, in visualizing and, and creating this novel? Well, it, it, it certainly it gave me it gave me a, 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 a thread that 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 connected the book to to the I, to the United States as it shaped itself in the 20th century. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. it, it was it was the way that I in, not only inhabited the characters, but I inhabited the country. And it's interesting, I think, that the two I don't you know, you were tiptoeing toward it, I think, but <laughs> but you would have you would have in your brilliance as a, as a as a reviewer, you would have noticed that what you responded to, you know, the way I inhabited hell and that he foresaw Trump. If you take Al Capone and Huey Long and put them together, take their worst traits and put them together, the traits that are manifest in this book, you also have Donald Trump. <laughs> and as you know, the book begins, literally begins at the 10, you know, at the moment that Trump is elected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Minutes later, God appears to, to Sam Cunningham in this book. And then the rest of the book, not, not the rest, there's, there's some interesting things that happen at the end of this book but for almost the rest of the book it all happens in a nanosecond it's it is that is so it is about the moment that that without saying it it is about the moment as well that that thing happened to the united states and uh what what the title late city what does what does that represent? Well, I, you, you you may remember this but uh, daily newspapers it used to be when when there was no way to turn on your computer at three in the morning and get an update uh, on something that that is just flashed upon through a website on the, on the internet um, the late city edition of a of a daily newspaper was the very last edition of the paper with all the last minute editions and corrections and whatever of that would bear the dateline of of that in, in this case the previous day because it'd be about two in the morning and so that um often so it was the last it was the last edition the late city edition was the last edition of that day's newspaper and of course not only is 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 sam you know the newsman for the reasons i've talked about but but you know it, this is his late city edition. That's right. what it is. Um, am I am I wrong in um, in thinking that this book, in addition to everything else that it is, is a celebration of um, the great newspaper tradition of the 20th century that we're seeing fall away now? Oh, uh, you know, I, I teared up a little at the at at the at the right moment in my book, and I am again now, for the vision you just mentioned. Yeah, you and I love, we have deeply loved 
everything about newspaper. Yeah. And yeah, it, it is a, it is indeed a celebration of that, that, that a life can not only be measured by it, but can resonate through it. And that that a, a century of a, of a country can resonate through those through those those newspapers. And I, you know, me and physical books, which I'm all we're also going to be losing someday. Uh, I, I am I, I've, I've first thing I did when I got the physical book of late city was I took the book, I'm gonna do it right here in front of you. Here it is, on, <laughs> on, on live on live thing. Here's the book, and this is what I did. Here it is. That What you're not seeing is I put my face in the center of this book, and I have sniffed. I am an inveterate book sniffer. I have never picked up a, a new book without smelling it. And by the way, just for those of you of like mind, Late City is one of the best smelling books ever published. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 uh, just a special marketing note there. But yeah, yeah but newspapers too. But seriously, the the smell of newsprint, oh, yeah. you know, and the feel of it, and the fact that it left its imprint on your very fingertips. I mean, yeah. these are this. The, the 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 full full body sensual experience of absorbing the events of the world is something that we have we are we are going to lose even before we lose books. Yeah, well, you know the the, the internet is extremely useful, but um, about ten years after I left newspapers, I had been freelancing and and I was so busy that I was getting all my information from the internet. Uh, but one day, for some reason, I went to my old coffee shop. I got I got a copy of the Miami Herald, and I sat down and drank my coffee and paged through the paper. I got to tell you, I saw things in there that I didn't know about. Local news I didn't know about. National news I didn't know about. Yep. Because, you know, news on online is curated by an algorithm. News in the newspaper is curated by journalists who, who have been trained and have their experience, and they know what they're doing. And... It's, it's, I mean, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to push something <laughs> to follow your chosen link, you know, or a link that the algorithm has chosen for you that, you know, that, that those things are there before you in a kind of, you know, like cinematic montage, what is next to what, you know, which has been something that, that a great, that the great journalists, you know, the great copy desks know how to, know how to orchestrate. Yeah, that's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm not so sentimental and, and old fashioned as to say that uh, we're not gaining a lot by uh, oh. digital media, but we're losing things too, you know. And we are I I, off as always. I you know, um, to I couldn't be writing the books I'm writing now, um, and have been for some years now, without the internet. Mm -hmm. um, the, the 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 ability the but you know you have to be clever about the it's it takes a skill too to find your way through the internet but the thing just came to mind is that flying arrow sled how would I you know how do you find that without the you know without the internet I all these books behind me are just desperate book buying of reference books that I might somewhere find what a sled of you know of that era would have uh, would have been mm -hmm. and I, I i i there are only about three of those books that i ever look at anymore and um the internet is and the internet is is makes it possible to to get the precise and resonant granular detail onto the page that that my sensibility would wishes to have yeah yeah on the other hand i can all i can tell when a book especially a nonfiction book has been researched mostly on the internet and not in the library people who just do the internet search even if they find the right searches they don't really their knowledge is not as deep their authority is not as sound i i don't quite know what it is well but, what it is is the, the good things about the internet were acquired the way that that <laughs> writer 
needs now to acquire the extra things. It's like old books and somewhat slimmer books usually than the one that you're planning to write. Nobody's writing the, the first book of that subject ever. And they would never rely only on the previous books written in order to write their book. For them, yeah. for, for their, book, their book to be great, it's the original real world connection that, that they need to put in there. Right, right. And, the, and Google allows anybody to appear to be an expert. Um, uh, yeah. Project, whether at, well, no matter how superficial their knowledge is. Bob, I wanted to ask you if, if Sam um, was patterned in any way, in the most general way, uh, uh, after any living 20th century American journalists like uh, Murray Kempton or Hiding Carter Jr. or somebody like that, or if he's just wholly a product of your imagination. Um, well, I'll go back to your introduction, or your, uh, or actually your, um, uh, maybe your first question is where you brought it up. Um, the only journalist it's patterned after in any way is Robert Olin Butler. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the sense that it's, it's not just my imagination. My imagination is made up of, of what Graham Greene called the compost of the imagination, which he identifies as all the things that you have known and lived and forgotten. He says all good mm -hmm. novels must have bad memories for that very reason. So <laughs> it, is, it is the compost of my imagination, which has to do with the sum total of my experience, my life experience. Mm -hmm. um, what leads you from one, one book to another, from one character, from one topic to another? Um, your last book was really nothing like this one. <laughs> I, I think, you know, it's funny. I wrote, I, I took a little fun time off and I wrote again about toward Graham Green, Green who wrote his what so-called entertainments, which, which deep down were just as serious as his other books. Mm -hmm. I wrote mm -hmm. four books in a row over about a six year period of the Christopher Marlowe Cobb books for Otto Pensler over at Mysterious Press. A, uh, another news one of yeah another news, newspaper another yeah. newspaper guy in, yeah. world, in World War One and and I, I think they they are all have a very serious undercurrent but but um, that was I noted to myself and it's and it's been true since then that those were those were in fact three of them I can't say it entirely. Three of those books were the first time I ever wrote two books in the in the, in a row that seemed to be from the same author. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? and I, I couldn't even write four in a row because I wrote Perfume River between the Star of Istanbul and Paris in the mm -hmm, Dark. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? So it was, you know, I, and how do I get from one to the other? Uh, it is that the mystery of the of my compost heap. I I I I just follow the voices and write the books that my, that, 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 you know, that, uh, that the muse of my, of my unconscious gives me. That's the best I can say. Bob, not to get too personal, but um, oh, you've been ahead. writing, you're right. You've been writing for a while. You're not as young as you used to be, but you <laughs> wouldn't know that from, you wouldn't know that from the page though. No, thank you. Uh, writing is a sprightly, the, the mind behind the writing is a sprightly. How do you keep your energy up since you're past the age of, oh, let's say 50? How do you keep your energy up and your output and your creativity? Because a lot of people start to run out of run out of gas. Maybe we just need to go back to the previous question for that. Because, and, and, and uh, go back to Graham Greene. I have a I have a really good bad memory. I have a really bad memory. So my life experience goes, you know, and, and not to mention the uh, previous books I've written, goes straight into the compost heap. I'm, I would be hard pressed to remember a single scene from a book I wrote, you know, from Paris in the Dark, or from, uh, yeah, Paris in the Dark. I forgot which book was my last book. <laughs> so, and I, and a lot, I think a lot of writers slow down when they become 76 years old or even sooner, because what they have been doing essentially is writing from either their compost heap is too narrow or they're, or, or they have been pulling too narrowly from it. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so they have been writing from the same place with the same characters and it's 
they just it just they run out of books because they have run out of of a way to get to to engage the deep human condition which they have previously engaged but but through characters and milieus that now are kind of the same that that they have access to i have forgotten everything and i could you know for whatever reason what keeps coming up is always new and so i think the fact that i've never written two books in a row that look alike that's a bit of an exaggeration but i think that's the reason i'm still i'm still writing books of the same sort of quality whatever that be mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think we're going to open this up to uh, questions in a minute but I, I have to ask you one more thing sure. i was thinking i was thinking back over the bob butler books that i've read and um i really can't think of a villain all all of your characters are just human beings some are worse than others you know um but uh you never you never seem to judge your characters um is that a is that a an, an artistic choice a moral choice or this is just a bob butler choice well it may be both of those things but not with those that with not with those abstract intentions which means it's a bob butler choice i mean even look even al capone and huey long mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know um i i cannot it and it has to go back to the thing i said earlier when i inhabit a character it's like playing god and if you're going to play god you better as sure as hell better be a a, a a compassionate god a loving god and i am in, in that way you know i you know i understand i mean i i when i'm inside a character i really try to you know to to fully inhabit any character means inhabiting them by seeing themselves as they see themselves and and they do not see themselves as as pure black villains and even if they did some deep part of them is going holy hell what what am i yeah I, because you know, I think all I think all literary fiction is about yearning, which which is to say, which is just the deeper level of all plot being about objectives and goals and characters. It's about yearning, and I have a I have a unified field theory of yearning in literary fiction. I believe if you dig deep enough in all literary fiction, every character is yearning in a book, but they are yearning for a self. They are yearning for an identity. They are yearning for a place in the universe. And if that's where you're living with any character, good or bad, then you are, you're connected to something that, that you are inevitably got to be, you know, empathic with. Yeah. I, I was thinking about hell, even the demons in hell who torment um, our hero, who was also a journalist, although a, a, a broadcast journalist, um, they're not judged really. They're, they're shown doing horrible things, but they're not condemned. They're just shown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, there was that one female demon who I could still have nightmares about, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, you know, they are just, they are, they are dancing the identity that they have temporarily landed upon. That's, yeah. that, that's what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so you, um, you put this one to bed, as we used to say in in uh, newspapers, and um, you're you're going to be touring and promoting this for a while. Yeah. Okay. Touring this way mostly, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Have you uh, been making notes on your next uh, your next I novel? Or? Thirty thousand words into my next novel. Oh wow! 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 You want to hear the setup? Sure. Husband and wife, each of them is 72 years old. They were married for 23 years. They were divorced for 10. They have remarried, have been married again for 10 years. They are now failing as a marriage again. They have come to Paris and are standing on the balcony of an Airbnb overlooking the the the, the, um, the, the Parc uh, de uh, 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 Chamont. Chamont. Anyway, wonderful park in the in the north of in the north of Paris. And that's where they met in 1968. That's why they are back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But as soon as they step out onto that, or you know, when as soon as they get into their room, 
Paris shuts down for the COVID virus. <laughs> they are trapped in 500 square feet on in that in that apartment, and you know what they do? They they he is a literary critic. I mean, sorry, a literary scholar. He's a literary uh -huh. scholar. She is a novelist, a pretty good one. And they decide to to since they have a, a, a you know a plague going on outside their window and they are trapped, they will reproduce the Decameron. They will tell <laughs> stories to each other. <laughs> so on alternate nights, they tell stories, uh. and, and they are free to fictionalize, but they are basically mandated to tell the stories of their lives together and before you know before and after each other. So. Um, that's that's the new book, and as that's, I say, I'm thirty thousand words into that. No, I can't. Well, I gotta say, I can't wait. You know, I can't help but think. You know, that's a that's a setup that has been used all the way back to I don't know the Bible, the um, sure. the, sure. uh, the Thousand and One Nights, um, yep. uh, Canterbury Tales. Sure. Well, also in the new novel, you you um, you have a character who's a, uh, almost outrageously old, 115 years. Uh, and he tells the story of his life for one reason or another. Um, that also has been used before. Um, my favorite before this was uh, Little Big Man by Thomas Berger, yeah, right. you know, where he's like 120 years old and he remembers the Old West and all that. Yeah. Um, great book. Um, now, obviously, you, you knew um, that this is, was not a new thing that you were doing. Um, did you think about how to revitalize it or did you just make use of it like a tool? Well, I, I would hope that you would in reading it feel it has, well, it's been revitalized. I mean, I, you know, yeah, yeah, it's revitalized because it came from my compost heap and not there, anybody mm -hmm. else. That's, that's the difference. And by the way, there is nothing new. I mean, what is right. a new, what, I mean, you look at, you look at most of the books or, well, there's, you know, family coming apart or whatever i mean you know it's just there there is there is no new fundamental concept in in literature that just doesn't exist essentially you know right 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 um look, look like we have got any questions so let's keep talking about uh the new book let's focus on the new book from here on out um what what is it about the book that you are most satisfied at this point? Um, something that may have surprised you as you wrote it. Um, well, everything surprises me. This is a book that I'm, I can't, and, and the older I get, the, the, the books I've written since I was, I've written three books since I turned 70, six years ago, you know? Mm -hmm. They are Perfume River, Paris in the Dark, and Late City. And, and I know, I, you know, there are, Folks close to me, including in my publishing house, that, that feel like those are three of the best books I've ever written, and I think they, I feel like they are, and and um, and and and, so, and and one of the reasons is that I, as I've turned seventy, uh, I have done less and less. I, I have had to rely, actually, more and more um, on on the immediate moment. As my, as, and and now you know in COVID, I've got in living. I think I mentioned in a town with a population of one. This has been particularly difficult for me. You know, full. There's been a lot of existential dread between writing sessions in this <laughs> in this writing cottage, and so um, uh, the thing that is that. Um, I, I am letting things. I am. I am looking forward less and 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 staying in the tumultuous moment more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 that and what that is and and especially given the fact that these these two lives are telling stories in parallel that have their own gestalt, even though they're much of the of overlap of the stories are of the same things. And then there's a lot of, and then the novel has its own existence as well in between stories between these two people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are three kind of, there are three novels sort of engaged with each other in the book. And, 
and 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 um, and so it's the way in which those stories, what stories are coming out, in what order, how they speak to each other, and then how it affects the 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 the, the, the narrative arc of the relationship, the larger relationship in the present. To, to manage all of that, you know, out here talking to the to the to the, to the birds outside my window and and um, you know trying to to keep on top of what life means at age seventy six, all of that at once, and the fact that it's it is actually happening. That's what's that's what I I look at with the most pleasure in this situation. Yeah, that's great. Um, we're we're running down on time, but we have a, a question from a, a reader. Uh, as you served in Vietnam, do wars remain a literary preoccupation for you, whether in the background or the foreground? Uh, good question, and they were the answer. Short answer is absolutely. Um, no, I you know all wars are different in their own technological way, but all wars are the same. In what in in the in the in the drastically enforced confrontation with with the deepest um, existential uh, realities of the human condition. That's the you know you and so you know since since and 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 also in terms of that unified field theory I mentioned because it's not just in fiction. Our it's. I think it's the unified field theory because it's it's the thing in life. Everything that we think of in life, you know, gender and, and politics and race and, and and ethnicity and religion and and you know the list goes on. Those things that that we feel are so crucial, um, um, those get challenged in war. But we feel they're so crucial. Except, what are they? What are they really? They are just prefabricated answers to the great and central question of who the hell am I? They'll mm -hmm. give you an answer. I am, I you know, I am. Pick pick one of those categories, and that's who I am. And and that's comforting thing, but it's also an incomplete thing, and it's also you're going to founder on that eventually. And and war pull war challenges all, all challenges all of those things and. The great "Who the hell am I?" is never more nakedly on in in front of you than in a war. Yes, I uh, I must um, must note that Lake City um, you personalize the war. You don't you don't take a big picture in any of the books that I've read. But in Lake City, you you have the firsthand experience of Sam as a soldier, but then you also have the non-combatant experience, the family experience, when his son goes to war. And that dilates to where you, you even take in the existential, the cosmic uh, question of nuclear war, that, that conversation that Sam and, and Colleen have about the advent of nuclear war. Um, pretty harrowing and yet satisfying stuff. And, uh, um, well, I'm, I'm just telling you how much I liked it, but, uh, sure. do you have, do you have any, I mean, the, the range of, of stuff you get into this one, one book on the question of war. Thank you. My, my heart goes pretty bad, Chauncey, whenever you start talking about my books. I, <laughs> you explain, here's what you do as a critic. You explain me to myself and that's the best thing a critic <laughs> Uh, well, I say, um, I say, book sniffers unite. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's our new motto. <laughs> you're gonna get a lot of no, you're gonna get a lot of nose stains in the middle of your books and books and books. Now I, I trust you. That. I know. Charge I, extra for those. <clears throat> we will. We will. So, what a great conversation! Thank you so much. Wonderful reading. My pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chauncey, for joining us. It's so great to see you. So great to hear from you. Um, let's do it again in person yeah. soon. Let's do it. Um, let's talk to you on the phone, my, my man. Well, you'll yeah. do that. We'll do that soon. 
And I'll remind everyone watching that you can order your copy of Late City here below by just pressing the green button if you haven't done so already. And just... <clears throat> and, I, and I will be happy to sign a book plate for such books too. And I think that's right. We said you were going to personalize. I don't know. Sorry, I have something stuck in my throat. I'm losing. <clears throat> so maybe you tell them, Bob. Well, I will have book plates. And if you want to buy a book that's got a personal <clears throat> note to it on, you know, we've got to do book plates, but it can have a personal note on it. If you if you buy it from Books of Books there and let them know what the personal note should, uh, who, to, who to sign it to, I will, I will, um, your, your name will be on the book plate as well. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much. for <coughs> I'm sorry, but nah, I can't. We I, forgive you. <clears throat> Always a pleasure. Yeah, you've got you got my book stuck in your throat, there, Christina. <laughs>